All right, so just before I start off, I'd like to take a moment to thank the traditional owners of the land in Canberra, the Ngunnawal and Nambi people. Um, we would like to acknowledge their elders, past, present and emerging. Uh, so let's get started and start talking about eclipses and shadows in space. And remember to leave any questions you have in the comment section below. So before we talk about eclipses and shadows in space, let's uh, have a bit of an idea of who's talking to you. Who am I? Well, my name's Ryan. I'm an astronomer. I finished my PhD in astronomy at the Australian National University, studying at Mount Stromwell Observatory, which was an incredible place to study. In my spare time, I make some videos for YouTube, and for my work, I look for exploding stars out in the universe. Now, I'm working at the Space Telescope Science Institute. And you may not have heard of this place before, but it's the place in America that handles the operation of space telescopes, like the Hubble Space Telescope. Now, I don't really use the Hubble Space Telescope for my work. I use some other space telescopes, like the Kepler Space Telescope, which tragically died and is now drifting in space since 2018, and the Transiting Exoplanet Survey Satellite, which is very useful for finding exploding stuff all across the night sky. But enough about me, let's start talking about shadows and eclipses. So before we get into shadows, we first need to talk about some kind of light source. In space, this light source is usually a star like our sun. And these light sources are big shining balls of light in space, and they emit light in every direction. So these stars will just happily shine out light. But what would happen if we put a planet in the way, something that doesn't shine light? Well, light coming from the star would fall upon the planet and it would illuminate one side, you get daytime, and the other side would be nighttime. So you also might think, that this planet blocking all this light would cast a shadow that looks like this. Everything in that rectangle behind that planet won't get any light from the star. Well, it's actually a little more complicated than that, and that's not the case. Because the star is a big ball. And it's complicated like this. If you looked at light coming from the top of the star, a lot of it will run into the planet or move past it, some of it will move above the planet and some of it will move below it. So it could pass on by the planet like that. And likewise, if you had light coming from the bottom of the star, it could pass above and below the planet like that as well. So you end up with this one region, this triangle or cone behind the planet where there's no light coming from the star. It's like a big shadow in space. But it's only this cone, it's not that rectangle that we had before. And either side of this cone, we have two other cones, which are partially shaded. We call these different areas the penumbra for the partially shaded areas and the umbra for the completely shaded areas. What would happen, though, if we put a moon orbiting this planet? Well, the moon would orbit around the planet and sometimes it would pass through the shadow of the planet. In reality, the scales are much more different and it's not so easy to have a moon pass through the shadow of a planet. But in this case, we can just tweak it and make it go where we want. So let's put the moon inside of the penumbra. What we end up with here is a penumbral lunar eclipse. So in this case, the moon is slightly fainter than what it would have been otherwise. But if we move, the moon slightly further along and have it obscured by the planet's shadow, then we end up with something called a partial lunar eclipse. And you may have heard of those before where half or part of the Earth's shadow will block out part of the moon. But if we move the moon even further still, we'll get to a total lunar eclipse where the moon is completely in the Earth's shadow and actually appears this kind of red color from light being bent around by the Earth's atmosphere and shone onto the moon indirectly from the sun. So to see what this looks like in real life, I've got this lovely video here from Colin Legg. 
So the moon starts in the penumbral shadow, moves through to a partial, and then to a complete solar eclipse. And then once it's past totality, it'll move to a partial eclipse and back out to a penumbral eclipse. So you can see where you get the Earth's shadow crossing the moon, and then it turns that lovely red color from all of the light bending through the Earth's atmosphere and falling onto the moon in the Earth's shadow. So the cool thing about this is we've actually got a penumbral lunar eclipse coming up on the 6th of June. So the moon will look a little bit fainter, starting at 3.45 a.m. Australian Eastern Standard Time, and it'll reach midpoint through the Earth's penumbra at 5.24, and it will cross out the other side at 7 a.m. So the moon will look a little bit fainter during these times, but if you're up while this is happening, it would be worthwhile to check it out. But it's not just planets that can cast shadows. We can have moons in space, and just like a planet, it will block out some light. So the moon will cast a shadow similar to what the planet does as well. And we end up with something looking like this, where we have the penumbra here, and if you found yourself inside the penumbra of the moon's shadow, you would be seeing something called a partial solar eclipse. If you were inside the umbra of the moon's shadow, you would be in a total solar eclipse. So again, to show you what this would look like in real life, let's look at another amazing video from again Colin Legg. So this is a, a total lunar eclipse that happened in 2012 in the Northern Territory of Australia. You can see that the moon blocks out the sun for a moment, then moves on again. So this is an incredible event that uh, I haven't seen myself, but I'm often recommended to try and spot a total solar eclipse at some point. So while I'm going through this talk, remember to put your questions down in the comments if you have anything you want me to answer. So it's not just a planet or the Earth and Moon that have eclipses. You can have eclipses happening all over the place. Here's a cool example of an eclipse happening on a neighboring planet. Jupiter, of course, the biggest planet in our solar system. It has a lot of moons orbiting it. And it has four big moons, one of which is shown here, is Io. It's the closest moon to Jupiter. And you can see that it's casting a very perfect circular shadow onto Jupiter's clouds. So if you were to find yourself floating in Jupiter's atmosphere underneath this black shadow, you would see a total solar eclipse uh, just like you would on the Earth. So these eclipses can happen all over the place, and they happen fairly regularly on Jupiter with all of its lovely moons. But eclipses aren't just property of uh, planets and moons. You can have them on rings as well. Here's another incredible example from Saturn. Now this image is taken by the Cassini space probe, which is, has burnt up in Saturn's atmosphere. But you can see a lot of cool stuff going on. You can see Saturn's shadow being cast on Saturn's rings. And you can also see the rings of Saturn casting a shadow on Saturn itself. So all of these objects in space can cast shadows all over the place. But shadows aren't just pretty things that you might see in space. They uh, can be very useful for science as well. So here's a quick example of how we can use shadows and eclipses in science. And it's to do with finding planets around other stars. So if you imagine a star sitting in the sky and you want to study it very closely, in particular how bright it appears to you, so you might want to measure it and plot it on a graph where the vertical or y-axis is the brightness and the x or horizontal axis is time. And if you were just normal, had a normal star, the brightness would kind of uh, mill around, not really do too much, it'd be very boring. But what would happen if we had a planet? Well, let's see. We'll send the planet across the star. So you can see that as the planet goes across the star, it casts a shadow on us, more or less, and blocks out some of the light coming from that star. And the brightness of that star dips. 
very small amount, but it does dip. And with very sensitive instruments, we can actually detect these things. And so far we've found thousands of planets orbiting distant stars. They're called exoplanets. Um, and there's many thousands more waiting to be discovered. So eclipses are more than just pretty things that we can take pictures of. So just to summarize these things, we talked about the lunar eclipses. There are three different kinds, the penumbral lunar eclipse, the partial lunar eclipse, and the total lunar eclipse. And there's a penumbral lunar eclipse that's going to happen on the 6th of uh, June. And there are solar eclipses, which is when the moon gets between the Earth and the sun, or any other star. And we can have lovely eclipses and shadows being cast on anything uh, in the solar system. And they're very useful for finding things out in the universe. So eclipses are generally very interesting, very pretty, and very useful objects. So with that said, um, I'll have some time now to, to take any questions you might have. So while we're waiting uh, for some questions to come through, I'll just take this moment to um, uh, show you all about this event that's going to be happening uh, tomorrow afternoon. Uh, the Young Stars program has a, a lecture, if you haven't got enough of astronomy this evening, uh, The Universe Beginning to End by uh, Professor Brian Schmidt. Um, it starts at 1 p.m. Australian Eastern Standard Time, and you can still register for this event through Eventbrite or watch it live on Facebook. All you need to do is search for the Young Stars program, and you should be able to find it in either of those places. So let's uh, answer some questions. So one question here is, can we detect exomoons? That is a very good question. And at the moment, um, there might be, there are some contested claims of exomoon detection, but it's, it's really tricky to detect it. Let me go back to this slide here, where I've kind of exaggerated what happens. The, in reality, the dip in brightness of a planet going in front of a star is only around 1% or less of the star's total brightness. So we need incredibly sensitive equipment to detect these tiny dips in brightness. Uh, and so far, we haven't been able to detect conclusively an exomoon through this transiting method. There are other methods of well, as well of using um, uh, spec, uh, radial velocity, so, which is a fancy way of telling us how objects move. Um, there, again, hasn't been any conclusive evidence. So exomoons might be something, or it definitely is something, left to discover in the future. It's a very hard thing to find. Another question is, how often does Australia experience total solar eclipses? Uh, well, total solar eclipses are reasonably common on the Earth. But the tricky thing is, uh, most of the Earth is ocean. So almost all of the total solar eclipses will fall somewhere in the middle of an ocean. Um, and I'm not sure exactly when the next one in Australia is. I think there might be one in the 2030s, but I'd need to look that up. Uh, next question is, oh, I've just gotten in. A, some help from the internet. Uh, apparently in the 22nd of July, 2028, over Sydney, thank you, Brittany, is when the next um, total solar eclipse will happen in Australia. Uh, so the next question is, if you could see any eclipse in the universe, what would it be? Um, if th so we can see lots of eclipses in the universe. There are lots of different kinds of things, like I showed in the talk. Any, any object that blocks light from another object that we can see would cause an eclipse. And we can see them from a whole lot of different things, uh, including planets um, and ones that may not even be around stars. Um, the next question is, how frequent are lunar eclipses? Lunar eclipses are pretty common. Um, there's one coming up in the near future, um, in the next year or so. Again, I'm a bit rusty 
on the dates of these things. So perhaps one of my friendly internet helpers can uh, give me a date on that one. Uh, it's the, the morning of the 6th, apparently. Um, uh, yeah, so that's, that's when the next part, penumbral solar eclipse will happen in the morning of the 6th of uh, June. Okay, next question. Has Juno captured any eclipses at Jupiter? It has actually. There are lots of amazing photos from the Juno spacecraft. For those that don't know, uh, Juno is a, a spacecraft which is orbiting around Jupiter, trying to understand, among many things, how Jupiter formed, how the storms operate on Jupiter's uh, big atmosphere. Uh, and it does this by taking lots of amazing pictures. And of some of those pictures, some of them are uh, eclipses. There are some I almost put in this talk, but decided on that other one. Okay, next question is, can space junk make a sun or planet less bright? Well, that's uh, an interesting question. They can eclipse things as well. Uh, anything that blocks up light coming from something else can eclipse an object. So there was a, a YouTuber by the name of Smarter Every Day, which during the uh, American sol total solar eclipse, found a spot in America where both the moon crossed in front of the sun and the International Space Station crossed in front of the sun and took images and videos of both objects eclipsing the sun more or less simultaneously. So anything in space can block light, but the amount of light that gets blocked by space junk and space stations is incredibly small. Uh, here's another question. Do eclipses occur with other parts of the spectrum? Yeah, so eclipses, um, whatever kind of light you look at, the object passing in front of something else will pretty much block all the light coming from it. Um, eclipses can get really interesting, though, if there is a, an atmosphere surrounding, say, an exoplanet. Because atmospheres interact with light, I said earlier that the, um, the light coming from the sun gets bent around the Earth, and that's why the moon turns red during a total lunar eclipse. The same kind of thing can happen if there's atmospheres around planets orbiting other stars. And the effect of that would be that on the same plot here, if you had observed the, the transit of a planet in one color, it would take out a certain amount of light. And if you observed with another color, it might take out maybe a little bit more of that light. And you can use computer models and atmospheric simulations to work out exactly uh, what that means the planet's atmosphere is made of. And there have been a few really cool uh, identifications of different uh, atmospheres out there around exoplanets. Okay, uh, do we have any more questions coming through? Ah, does a black hole cause an eclipse? That's a very good question. Uh, it's right. So, so eclipses. Another really useful tool for eclipses is, uh, which was uh, testing theories of gravity. So we're all used to um, uh, how gravity works on the Earth. If we jump up, we get pulled back down, uh, and we don't go flying off into space. But in extreme environments around stars or around black holes, gravity can do some pretty strange things. It can bend and warp space so that um, light itself bends as it travels around these objects. Now this principle was observed for the first time during a uh, solar eclipse where stars were, had shifted position during the solar eclipse that were sitting right next to the sun from where we expect them to be to where we observe them to be. And that shift was due to the sun's gravitational influence. Now with black holes, because they have extreme gravity, the shifts that they cause uh, light is pretty astounding. Um, and if you've seen a movie called Interstellar, there's a really cool model of uh, a black hole in that, where the black hole lenses, it's called, bends light up, 
above and below itself. So if a object sits behind a black hole, copies of that object will get made above and below it. So you could imagine a kind of um, duplicate image around the, the black hole. So it's instead of blocking out the object's light, it will actually amplify the object's light and make it brighter than it would have been without the black hole in the way. Uh, on to the next question. Are there exoplanets in our solar system? So in our solar system, we have planets and the way an exoplanet is defined is it must be a planet orbiting a star that's not our sun. So by definition, we don't have any exoplanets in our solar system. The nearest exoplanet we have is around the nearest star to our sun called Proxima Centauri. And there's a, a little planet that's about the size of the Earth running around Proxima Centauri, which is about 3.4 or so light years away from us. So that's the nearest exoplanet that we know of. Next question is, what kind of mineral deposits may be on the far side of the moon? Uh, that's a very good question and one which starts to stray out of things I know. Uh, but in general, the surface of the moon is made out of the same stuff as the surface of the earth or the crust of the earth. So you would expect to see a lot of the same stuff that the earth is made of. Uh, one of the things that you would also find that's not so uh, common on the earth is lots of helium on the surface of the moon. And that's because the moon catches helium that the sun emits out in great big solar winds. So particles streaming away from the sun uh, will land on the moon and make these little helium deposits. So that's uh, one of the very interesting materials that you might be able to find on the far side of the moon. Uh, the next question is, what's space traffic like at the moment? Uh, how many astronauts are in, the, are in space right now? Uh, so space traffic um, is getting more busy. As more and more satellites go up into space, things get more complicated, more crowded, and you've got to be very careful that satellites don't run into other things. Uh, so space traffic's okay at the moment, but it may get pretty tricky in the future. At the moment, uh, there, are about th there are three people on the space station, and there are two more which were supposed to be launched into space yesterday, but got delayed because a big storm came through and they should be trying to relaunch again. I think it's tomorrow morning. Uh, so the next question is, uh, where do black holes lead to? Answer one question on black holes and then you're bound to fall into another. So black holes are, of course, the big exciting mystery of physics and astronomy. There are these strange objects that sit in space which um, kind of break our understanding of physics because they need to obey the laws of gravity, which are uh, defined by general relativity and quantum, and the laws of the very small things, which are defined by quantum physics. And we can't mix those two correctly at the moment. Uh, the question of where the black hole leads to is a question that we have no real answer to. Um, if you were to fall into a black hole, you would get torn to pieces before you had a chance to see what might be on the other side. And if you don't get uh, killed, I guess, by being torn to pieces by the black hole, uh, time will slow down to an incredible crawl so that you might never actually fall into the black hole from an outside perspective, at least. Uh, the last question that we have, is can we use the helium on the moon to do nuclear fusion? Yeah, that was actually an argument that's been around for a while, is that this uh, helium deposits we have on the moon, and specifically uh, helium-3, is uh, very useful for making fusion reactors. So you slam the helium atoms together along with some other things like uh, lithium, and you can make a lot of very clean energy that way. Uh, but it's very tricky to get up to the moon and mine things off the moon. So at the moment, I don't think, uh, it, I think it'll be a while before we can use helium from the moon in nuclear fusion reactors. 
So anyway, thank you all for coming along and listening to my talk. Hope you learned a little bit about eclipses and I really enjoyed all the questions you had. So I'm gonna hand over now to Brad Tucker. Hello everyone. Um, so thanks for tuning in and thanks Ryan for your great talk. Uh, you know, uh, so what we're gonna do now um, for the next about 15-ish minutes, uh, 20 minutes before uh, Marta uh, Yebro speaks after me about some really cool things about how we're using space to help with bushfires is we're gonna do some virtual stargazing. Now, the way this is gonna work uh, is you can play along at home. You can do this wherever you want. I will explain how we're gonna see a few things in the sky and using the magic of technology, i.e. I've taken some photos and videos just a few minutes ago, we're gonna look at what it kind of looks at outside and it's pretty clear. Um, and you know, hopefully where you are, it's clear. And if not, you can enjoy at home uh, right now, hopefully on your couch and it's quite warm and cozy. It's a bit cold here in Canberra. Um, it's not too bad, it's brisk, it keeps us alive. Um, and you know, I always like starting with this photo here and this is taken at Mount Stromlo at night. And, and one of the cool things you see here are these stars swirling around? Uh, and that's because this is taken at what we call the South Celestial Pole. Now, the South Celestial Pole is the point where the Earth actually spins. So uh, the Earth spins on an axis. It's about 23.8 degrees. So we're a bit tilt tilted over. Uh, and because of that, when it spins, uh, you see stars kind of trailing around uh, in a, a very interesting pattern. And so the way to take something like this, this photo of this, is, is to find south, aim south. Uh, and you just leave your camera, you do an exposure, uh, you know, your uh, DLR or some, DSLR or something like that. You know, take a, a photo every 10, 20 seconds, and you'll see over time, the star trails, the stars moving. Um, and so it's a very easy way of seeing literally the rotation of the planet, uh, that nice circular ball, that we are on and seeing how the stars move with it. Now, one of the other reasons I really like showing this photo, and it also happens to be my virtual background, uh, is when we notice here, you know, this, this yellow bit. So this photo is taken pointing southwest, roughly, um, pretty south, more south, southwest. And that yellow bit isn't, you may think, oh, that's a sunset. Um, no, this is light pollution from the suburbs of Canberra. This photo is taken in the dead of the night, I think is roughly around one or 2 a.m. And that glow is purely from light pollution, from our houses and um, buildings and those sorts of things. And, and it's always a good point to show that, you know, we obviously need light, we need to see at night, and it plays a very important role into us, but we don't wanna lose the ability to see the nighttime sky, something that we can do here in Canberra which is rare compared to other places. We can go outside um, and we can see, uh, you know, the Milky Way, for instance, with our own eyes. And some of these things that we can see, and I'll show you tonight, it's because we have pretty dark skies. You know, there are parts of the world where they've never even seen with their own eyes the Milky Way, yet we're, you know, we're great opportunity, a great chance for us to go outside and see it. And Part of that is making sure light pollution is reduced. And we all play a part, uh, turning off lights at home, making sure either lights are on timers or things like shielding, downward facing lights, so we don't actually bleed into the sky because the, the more light goes up, the more it reduces our visibility to see the beautiful nighttime sky, something that um, is a great thing that we have here in Canberra and Australia in general. Now, let's start off a bit with what we could see. So this is a kind of a snapshot I took from a program called Stellarium. Stellarium is free to download. It's a great tool to use to try and find things in the nighttime sky. And if you're out anytime tonight or uh, the next few nights in the early evening, and when I say the early evening, um, we're talking about right after sunset. So about right after sunset, so around 5.30, 6 o'clock. This is taken just before 6 o'clock, so this kind of plot animation. What you'll see is a couple things. If you look west, due west, there will be a very bright dots just setting below the horizon. That's Venus. So Venus is sometimes called the evening or the morning star sky or morning star rather. 
Uh, it's been out in the evening skies for the past better part of a couple months. So if you've gone out and you've seen, hey, there's a really bright object in the western skies after sunset, that's Venus. Now, right now, we're also gracing the skies with the planet Mercury. Now, the great thing about both Mercury and Venus, if you have a, a pair of binoculars or a small telescope, is they have phases just like the moon. And this is kind of a cool thing that really shows how the phase of Venus moves. So even though it looks like a little bright circle, a bright dot on the western skies, over time, as you see, starting all the way from November, getting different all the way down to just about now, it's gone from a, a full circle to just a sliver. It actually looks more like the moon rather than what you think a planet might look like. Now, if you have a, a, a some binoculars or small telescope you pointed at Venus, Mercury the same as well, you won't see that full circle. You really will see just, it's like Pac-Man or, or a bit taken off of it, that most of it has been removed. And so this is quite a unique thing. And that's the phases of the inner planets. Now, in fact, the phases of Venus is something Galileo actually used to prove that the Earth not this or that the sun not the earth was the center of the solar system and because of the motion of the planets he realized that in only the only way to explain the phases of venus and mercury is as if earth was not at the center but the sun now the cool thing about this is because of the way the planets work the further out on the planet you go the more phases of other planets you see so if you're on mars you see phases of mercury you see phases of Venus, and you see phases of Earth. If you're on Jupiter, you see phases of Mercury, Venus, Earth, Mars, and so on and so on and so on. And so the phases are a really fundamental thing um, that not only prove and understand how our, our solar system works, um, but also greater how the universe works. And some people are, when, when Ryan was talking about uh, seeing eclipses, um, with the satellite Juno around Jupiter and some of its moons. We've seen phases of the moons of Jupiter. We've seen phases of the moons of Saturn, for instance. So it's a really cool thing that you can see just looking to the western skies with these two bright things. Now, of course, if you're looking out tonight, you'll notice a very beautiful moon. But before we get to the moon, there's also something that just is in the western skies. And that is Orion's Nebula. Now, Orion is a famous constellation, uh, so some people in Australia might call it the saucepan because we have the handle here and the three lines. So some people call this the saucepan. In um, Greek mythology, this is called Orion. So here are the shoulders going down to the belt, the sword down to the knees and legs. So this is famously known as Orion's belt. Now, one of the big stars in Orion uh, is Betelgeuse. Now, Betelgeuse was is within, in the news um, a couple of months ago because it was getting dim and it was acting a bit funny. And some people thought that Betelgeuse may explode. Now, it's not like the movie, if you say three, Betelgeuse three times, it explodes. Otherwise, astronomers would have. Um, one of the things I specialize in is exploding stars, and I really want Betelgeuse to blow up. That's because when Betelgeuse does blow up, and it will blow up any day now, any day being 10,000 years, so you know, don't hold your breath, unfortunately, um, it will be very bright in the nighttime sky. Now, Betelgeuse is what we call a red supergiant. So it goes through phases of slightly brightening and slightly dimming. And if you looked at the constellation Orion uh, late last year, you would have noticed that Betelgeuse was actually much fainter than the other star, Rigel. But nowadays, it's getting brighter. It's getting back to its more normal state. But when, if and when, Betelgeuse blows up, the brightness will approach the full moon. So it'd be like going outside in the night and all of a sudden you see a bright object like the moon, but it's actually Betelgeuse. That's how bright it will get and it'll last for months. So it's a really great thing that we all hope to see. But the real reason I think we wanna focus on Orion tonight is in the middle of the handle or the sword. So we have the three stars of Orion's belt, and we have the three stars of the handle or the sword. And the middle is not actually a star. This is Orion's Nebula. So this is the photo courtesy of Dave Weldrake, uh, who took it using uh, the 12 inch telescope we have. So if you have a telescope at home and point to that middle star of the handle, this is what you'll see. 
So this is just putting a camera next to the telescope. Uh, the telescopes that we'd use for every other public night. These are the sorts of views you get to see. And so what you're kind of seeing is a bunch of gas. And the gas is lit up in different colors. And what those colors are, are actually different elements. So Orion's nebula is caused by a star that's actually puffed out. It's essentially burped. And it shed all of this gas into space. And so this, this fuzzy, kind of milky, hazy glow is because all that gas is expanding. And eventually, gravity will pull it back together and they'll form new stars. So nebula are quite a common thing. Now, some people call Orion's nebula M42, Messier 42. And it's a very easy object to find. It's one of the easiest objects, I think, um, besides some of the planets to find with your own telescope. Because it's easy to find the constellation Orion. You just go to that middle object in the handle or the sword, and there you go, you get Orion's nebula. And so this is kind of the, the essentially the view we're getting of Orion's Nebula right now. If you could go outside and you could do a tour, as I said, I hope you're comfortable wherever you are and enjoying something warm. Now, as I said before, we had phases of Mercury and Venus, and obviously right now we're in the phase of the moon. So this is a video I just captured. And so what you'll see is we're going to be moving around the surface of the moon. Now, the moon is in a waxing crescent phase. So the moon can either be waxing or waning. Waxing means it's getting brighter towards a full moon. Once you get a full moon, it starts to wane. A crescent is when it's less than half. A gibbous is more than half. So a waxing crescent means we're getting brighter going from 0% moon to 50% moon, 50% being essentially a half moon. Now, one of the cool things I think about looking at uh, the moon is the shadow the line between the dark light and the dark. And in fact, in astronomy, we call that line the Terminator. Uh, no, it's not named after Arnold, Arnold Schwarzenegger, who used to be my governor, uh, the great governor. Um, the Terminator is just a term we use for the termination between the light and the dark side. Um, I mean, it's kind of a cool name, obviously, so we really like it, but it's, a, it's the technical term for that shadow between the light and the dark. And one of the cool things you'll notice along the Terminator is you see lots of craters. Now, the reason you're seeing lots of craters along the Terminator is not because there's more there, but we get contrast. So because we're getting that light and dark, we're getting the contrast between the light and the dark, and it's able to accentuate those craters more. The craters are fairly even across the surface of the moon, except a couple places I'll explain in a second. Um, but it really is uh, a way of accentuating these features. And what you see already is, you know, we're really zoomed in on the moon here, and you can really see the scales of these craters. Some are quite big, some are small. And if you look here right now, this crater in particular, you see how it has the little bump in the middle. So we have the giant circle, and we have the little bump in the middle. Now, the cool thing that happens is there's actually a little mountain that forms in the middle of the craters of the moon or any object that has a big crater impact, including meteorites that strike here on Earth. And what happens simply is when the rock hits the object, the moon or the Earth, it travels through space, it slams into the ground and it's traveling tens if not hundreds of thousands of kilometers fast. And it hits with so much force and so much power, it actually turns the ground into a liquid, it actually liquidifies the ground. And so it has a wave travel through it. So a good way of thinking about this is, imagine you're standing in the water and you drop a rock in the water. Well, the water will go out and then the wave will stop and it'll come back in and then you get the little dollop in the middle. So, you know, imagine you're in the bath or something like that. Uh, you drop the rock or something in, the wave goes out and then it comes back in and you get the little whoop, in the middle. That little bump in the middle, that little bloop, is literally that same thing happening. It's the ground moving as water traveling through it. And what you'll notice as we zoom around here is that some of the bigger craters have it and some of the smaller ones don't. And that's kind of exactly what we think. It was when you get to a certain size, you have enough force, enough energy, you slam into the surface of the moon, um, and you create this dollop. Uh, so it's a kind of a really cool thing we get to see. Now, obviously, one of the things that's famous for looking at the moon um, is that there's lots of craters, obviously. 
but why does the moon have so many craters? Well, it simply has so many craters because it has very little atmosphere. It's been bombarded by things. The atmosphere doesn't slow anything down. Uh, nothing stops it, and it just slams to the ground. Now, the Earth gets hit with tons of stuff all the time. There's about 200 tons, literally 200 tons worth of rock and stuff that hits the Earth every single day. Now, most of this is very small things that burns up in the Earth's atmosphere. And because of it, we don't get these cratering effects. We also have lots of oceans. So they land in the ocean, we don't see it. Uh, whereas the moon, lots of all land, uh, very little atmosphere, so it just crashes into it. So it's not that it ha it's more unlucky or anything like that compared to the Earth. It's just the way the moon is, is structured. Now, one of the other big features you see of the moon are these dark areas. And these are called Mari. So if you notice right here, right, we have this, this dark area here, and we'll go back to another one, but we can compare it to this other area. So this part is not dark, it's that light area of the moon, and you can go out right now and see the moon. We have the darker areas and the lighter areas. So here are the darker areas, the Mari, here are the lighter areas. Do you notice the darker area has very little to no craters, right? So even right here, tons of craters, the darker Mari, very few craters, maybe one or two. Why is that? One of the interesting things is these Mari are actually the most recent volcanic lava flows on the moon. The ground is actually a little bit different. So Mari actually means sea. So some of them are called Sea of Tranquility, one of the landing spots for the Apollo mission. And because the ground, imagine, you know, think about like volcanoes in Hawaii or something like that. The ground's a bit harder, but it's also a bit younger. It's a bit younger, so it's had less time to be bombarded by craters and therefore it appears a bit smoother and also less cratering. And so this is kind of a cool thing that you could just see even with your own eyes. You don't even need a telescope to see that, that there's less craters on the Mari as opposed to the rest of the surface. Uh, now someone has asked, uh, how do we get a supermoon? So this is the great question. So the moon um, has phases. So the moon goes around the, has, goes around the earth about every 29 and a half days. So every 29 and a half days, uh, we go through the full phase cycle. So um, we go from new moon to half moon to full moon and back. The moon also varies. It wobbles in its orbit. And that's because the moon is not in a perfect circle around the Earth. So sometimes uh, it gets closer and sometimes it's further. So in, when the moon is closer, we call it perigee. When it's further, it's called apogee. So the average distance to the moon is 384,400 kilometers, but the orbit varies by almost 50,000 kilometers. So sometimes it's literally almost 50,000 kilometers closer, about 340,000, sometimes much further, about 430,000 kilometers. And so a supermoon um, is when you get a perigee moon and what we call a sigi. So a sigi is when three objects line up in space. And to get a full moon, you have to have the sun, the earth in the middle, and the moon on the other side. So we see that side of the moon, it lights up, and we see it full. So you'll always, A, have a lunar eclipse when it's a full moon. So if you notice, on the 6th, when we have that partial lunar eclipse, it will also be a full moon. So a perigee sigi is the technical term for what we call supermoon. Uh, and so the moon, because it does an orbit every 29 and a half days, it, every 29 and a half days it has a point of perigee and apogee. So it's actually more common than we hear of sometimes in the moon or in the news. But when it is closer, it is a bit closer. It therefore is a bit bigger and it is a bit brighter. And if you can kind of compare side by side between supermoon and micromoon, micromoon being uh, apogee sigi moon, uh, you can really see the difference. Uh, and, and just a question before, before I hand it over to Marta, um, what does the moon also have? One of the things the moon has a lot of is ice. Yes, just like the thing uh, that you can drink and, uh, and freeze and will go on and frost on our lawns overnight. The moon, especially in these crater areas, has lots of ice. And this is the big thing, the whole return to the moon effort is about extracting the ice because we can use ice for rocket fuel. We can also use ice uh, for drinking because ice is hydrogen and oxygen that can be converted into rocket fuel. In fact, uh, if you go on the Facebook, uh, the Facebook feed of Mount Shromlo, you can see a demo by 
uh, Caitlin talking about how to create your own hydrogen. This is exactly the same process that we're planning to do around the moon. So that's gonna be the biggest thing that we can have and use there. And, and last question is, have any meteorites crashed into ACT that I know of? No, I don't. Um, there may have been some. Probably the most famous meteorite in Eastern Australia was the Murchison meteorite that crashed uh, 51 years ago in 1969. 1969 was a big year for space, Apollo 11 and Murchison. And it's big because that has actually been dated to come from something that is 7 billion years old. That's a big deal. The solar system is 4.626 billion years old. This is 7 billion years old. This did not come from the solar system. It actually predates the solar system. So it's one of the most important discoveries that we've actually recently had. And it's because that meteorite crashed into a town in Victoria 51 years ago. So stay tuned. Um, I will stop this and I'm gonna hand it over to Marta. And so Marta Yebra uh, is gonna talk about some really exciting things. And you know, after the summer um, that we've had, um, I think we all realize you know, the, the response from the bushfires that Australia faced this past uh, summer. Uh, one of the people who you didn't probably realize was in the middle of it helping uh, was Marta. Uh, she's using what she's going to talk about here to help to predict those fire maps. When you see those fire maps that really were, you know, saving lives, and I'm not trying to be dramatic, you know, we used to understand um, what the fire was doing, how it was moving. It was Marta and others in that team who did it. And so she's going to talk about some, I mean, some, probably some of the most important work you'll hear that is actually happening, I think, in Canberra right now, and that is how we're gonna use satellites uh, to help not only plan and mitigate, but helpfully monitor uh, bushfires. And, and, and Marta is the person. Um, so Marta Yebra is a senior lecturer at the Finner School of Environment and uh, the Research School of Mechanical and Enge Environmental Engineering at ANU. Um, and uh, yeah, I think you'll, you'll enjoy this talk. And after Marta, we'll do a little bit more virtual stargazing. So I'll hand it over to her. Uh, hi, Brad. Uh, thank you for the introduction and thank you everyone for joining me tonight. Um, I hope you enjoyed the first talks as much as I did. And over the, uh, the next about 30 minutes or so, instead of uh, you looking up to the sky, uh, I'm going to make you looking down. So I'm going to send you to the space and look down to the earth. So I'm going to be uh, talking uh, and giving you a brief overview of the current available and the next generation of space-based data uh, and mapping technologies that are helping uh, bushfire management uh, to better prepare and respond to bushfires. So, well, unfortunately, I said I will go to take you to space, but I cannot do that. And anyway, I'm not sure you prefer to be at home or at the space at the uh, 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 now, <laughs> but then, um, but then um, we already have ice in the skies. Uh, so there are a lot of satellite instruments that are imaging our planet and are helping us uh, to observe and understand the Earth processes. So this animation here uh, is from the NASA's uh, the, the the United States Space Agency fleet of uh, Earth observation spacecraft. And uh, currently, the satellite instruments, uh, such as uh, these ones here in the animations, and other uh, instruments launched by other international space agencies, issue an immense amount of data, so terabytes per day. So that remotely sends uh, experts like me profess and convert into useful information or products that are useful in decision making and planning. So when it, when it comes to bushfire management, uh, this vast array of data collected from space uh, can be used to inform different phases of fire management. So in a nutshell, uh, this uh, slide shows that before the fire, remote sensing data can be used uh, to monitor fuel condition, which will affect uh, fire danger likelihood, for example. 
Uh, during the fires, uh, we can use remote sensing data or satellite data to identify areas of the land uh, with, with anomalous uh, high temperatures or to visualize the smoke, uh, which help to detect after fires. And also, also to know how this, the fire will spread based, for example, on, on the fuel condition and the weather conditions. And this information helps to most efficiently direct a suppression and evacuation uh, decisions. So finally, after the fire, uh, remote sensing data can be used to assess uh, the fire stand, uh, the emissions from the fires, and the impact in terms of fire severity, and also uh, to tell us how the vegetation uh, is recovering after fire. So moving to the applications of uh, satellite data to assess uh, pre-fire conditions, uh, the main objective here is around estimating fire danger. So this is uh, the risk a bushfire occurring. So a good fire danger rating system is of, is of very importance as, as it supports a range, a range of critical decisions such as uh, prepositioning fire fighting resources, issuing public safety warnings and information or limiting the potential of ignitions through the use of total fire bans and we know very well what this means as uh, we've been going through these total fire bans very often here in Australia and sometimes it prevents us to do that barbecue we wanted to do and this slide uh, gives an overview of the new fire danger rating system that is under development uh, that include factors for fire weather, fuel condition, fire behavior, emission, likelihood, fire suppression, and fire impact. So under this uh, complex framework, uh, remote sensing data is uh, mainly used uh, to estimate a uh, fuel condition. And uh, in case you don't know what a fuel condition is, uh, I, I will explain now. So fuel is all life or dead vegetation that accumulates over time and therefore can potentially burn at any time. And its condition includes moisture content, structure and quantity or load. So all these components of fuel condition affect uh, the flammability of the landscape and therefore the potential severity of a bushfire. So for example, thinking about fuel structure uh, or the arrangement of the fuel that, um, that is separated, is is the fuel that is separated is less likely to carry a fire than a fuel that is continuous and, and packed. In addition, more fuel uh, means uh, larger flames and greater fire intensity. Finally, uh, when fuel uh, is high, uh, there is less chance of a fire emission uh, than if the fuel is low, uh, fuel moisture is, is low, so if the vegetation is dry. So let's start with the fuel moisture content. Uh, there are various uh, methods that have been developed to estimate this variable from remote sensing data or, or data collected from, from satellites. And I'm going to try to briefly explain why this is possible because I thought perhaps some of you were curious uh, to know the physics behind this. So, well, when the solar radiation hits the surface of a leaf, a uh, part of it is absorbed, other is transmitting to other layers in the plant, and most importantly, other fraction of this incoming solar radiation is reflected from the leaf's uh, surface back to the sensor that are on board of the satellites in the space. So this fraction of the solar radiation that travels back to the sensor is called reflectance and is represented in this figure in the, in the, in the left. So basically this figure shows the reflectance for two plants uh, with different moisture content. And as you can see, there are big differences mainly in this region here of the spectra. And this is because the water in, in the leaves absorbs a lot of the radiation in this area of the spectrum. So depending on, on the leaf tissue again, uh, or the, sorry, in the, depending on the leaf uh, tissue water content, the reflectance is therefore reduced 
to a varying extent. And based on these principles, we can create algorithms that convert the reflectance measured by the satellite into fuel moisture content uh, values. And this is happening in, in near real time. So this animation here presents uh, as an example the dynamics, uh, the dynamic variation of fuel moisture content for Australia for 2019. And these maps uh, were derived from data collected by a satellite from the NASA that is called uh, MODIS. Uh, and uh, this animation show us, as expected, the fuel moisture content values are constantly low in the desert central areas uh, of Australia. Um, but uh, there are a strong seasonality elsewhere. For example, um, in, in January, well, now we are moving towards summer, we can see how the southeast coast get more red pixels. Well, now where are we? Hold on. Uh, this is uh, September, December. So we are moving to a summer. Uh, as we move into summer, summer, there is more red areas in the coastal area. But as we, as the, um, as we move into into um, into summer, there are less values, and the total, the temporal pattern is the opposite in the tropical region. So in the north of the country higher life fuel moisture contents are observed during the northern wet season, that is December to March, uh, and lower values are during the dry season, that is uh, April to October. So these seasonal patterns of fuel moisture content have, have been demonstrated uh, to be linked uh, to fire uh, landscape flammability and therefore uh, fire occurrence. For example, um, uh, unusually dry fuel and hot weather uh, was one of the factors that explained uh, the high fire activity we had in the southeast Australia during the last fire season. So this uh, map, uh, this figure here, for example, shows you uh, the fuel moisture content nationally uh, for the different years, uh, and we can see how in 2019. Uh, the fuel moisture content was the lowest in record. When focusing in the southeast uh, forest, uh, these figures uh, tell a similar story. So in black, uh, we see uh, the satellite base average uh, fuel moisture content for the southeast uh, forest during 2000-2018. And in blue, we see uh, the low uh, moisture values that the same forest, uh, the same forested areas uh, reached uh, during the 2019 2020 fire season. So, anybody can get access to these uh, maps if you were wondering. And um, here I show a screenshot of the public website we have developed to facilitate the access to this information. As a quick uh, tour, for example, you can search for any, um, where's my mouse? Uh, sorry, yeah. So you can search uh, for any, uh, any date uh, since 2001. You can search for any location here and you will have the map of Australia that then you can zoom in in any, any area of Australia. So as an example, um, uh, well, here uh, what you can also see is uh, in black, uh, the areas in black are represent the total burnt extent reported by the emergency uh, authorities at a given time. Uh, and the, uh, the red flames are the active fires also reported. Uh, this uh, is basically the same information that uh, you may have seen in the fires near me, but with this website, we also provide information of the, of the fuel moisture content. So this uh, screenshot in, in, uh, that I prepare, uh, I searched for the fuel moisture content maps uh, during one of the days of the Oral Valley fire in the 25th of uh, January. And as you can see, the fuel was very dry that day, and uh, and that um, <clears throat> and that they may have uh, yeah 
describe the, the, the intensity of this fire. As a comparison, uh, I also include the, the same, the map of the same day, but in 2011, and you can see a huge difference. So now we, the map is pretty much blue. That means it has very high values. And again, if we go back to this map, we can see how red everything was. So the, the dryness of the landscape was quite spectacular. So moving into a mapping a fuel structure and, and load, so this is best captured uh, with uh, a remote sensing method that we call LIDAR. So the principle behind LIDAR is really uh, simple. It's a lot simpler than what I explained before. So basically the LIDAR is an active sensor or an instrument that uh, fires a rapid pulse of a laser light at a surface and measures the time it takes to return to its source. So as the light moves at a constant unknown speed, the LiDAR measurements can calculate uh, the distance between uh, itself and the target with high accuracy. So by repeating this uh, quickly uh, in succession several times, the instrument uh, can build up a complex map of the surface uh, uh, that is measuring, and this is called a point cloud. So up to a few years ago, uh, you could only have accurate uh, LiDAR data from on-ground sensors, uh, such uh, these two uh, that I display here on the bottom of, of the slide. Uh, um, but uh, nowadays, uh, there are satellite LiDAR observations uh, that are, great, uh, are now greatly increasing. Uh, with the recent launch of, for example, the JEDI um, mission that is, is a NASA mission on board of the International Space Station. So LIDAR can reconstruct uh, the three-dimensional structure of a forest, uh, providing extremely detailed information of the forest structure and load. And here I show you an example of a point cloud of the Black Mountain. So you can see the Telstra Tower up there. And here, this animation, uh, yeah, it works. Yes, it's a, it's a specific location, a zooming into this point cloud. Uh, and to this point cloud, uh, we have um, basically run a complex automatic algorithm to classify the different points in the cloud into the different layers of the forest. And then uh, from this, uh, we can start to extract uh, properties of the fuel, of the different fuel layers that are relevant for fire behavior, like the percentage of cover of the near surface fuel or the elevated fuel or the height of the trees or things like that. By the way, I, I just take a time to remember you that if you have uh, questions, remember to write them in Facebook and I will answer them when I finish. So apart from using LiDAR derived information on fuel structure and load in, in fire behavior modeling, uh, uh, also the, the maps are very important to provide useful information for separation activities. For example, this is a map of, of the, of the uh, elevated fuel uh, load derived from LIDAR. So basically in red, uh, you see areas with high loads and in blue, you see areas uh, with low fuels. And these maps were used, for example, in 2018. You may, have re you may remember that there was a small fire uh, small in comparison with what we had this year, of course, um, around the square rocks. So um, these LiDAR maps were used to locate a site free of trees to win the specially firefighters in because it was a remote uh, fire. And also it was used to try to pick up the easy uh, line to construct the walking track to the fire. Next. Okay, so now moving into the applications of remote sensing during the fires, the objective here is to use uh, satellite-based data to detect active fires. 
uh, and determine how the fraud is going to spread and also uh, find both uh, what we call soft and hard containment lines. So soft lines, containment lines can be, for example, differential in fuel moisture content. So uh, if, you, if there is a, a part of the forest that has, that is wetter, uh, that can have uh, like a soft containment line. So when the fire hits that wet area, the, it may uh, spread slowly and it will be easier to contain. And the hard uh, uh, containment lights normally refer to roads and, and, and paths and things like that. So most people may have seen, uh, let's see this is an animation, okay. So most people may have seen these this maps uh, here on, on the right uh, during the last five season as they were very popular in the media. So these maps are hotspots. So uh, what it is really is thermal anomalies uh, used to identify active fire. So this animation uh, I have borrowed from Robbie. So as a time series of the active fires during, during the last fire season. And it's, it's just spectacular to see how the activity grow over time. So one of the important aspects when it comes to detect active fires using satellite observation is the frequency in Nimitz acquisition. So of course, the, the more frequently uh, the satellite collect imagery of a specific area, the higher the chances that you will be able to detect a, a fire as soon as it, it ignites. So this animation uh, show you on the left active fires uh, detected by the NASA MODIS satellite I mentioned uh, before. And that is, uh, this, uh, this sensor is on board of the Terra and Aqua platforms that views the entire Earth's surface every one or two days. And the, four, uh, the frequency uh, of observation is a bit limited for bushfire, uh, active fire uh, detection. So on the right, on the other hand, uh, you have uh, the detections uh, detected by, by Imawari-8, that is a just, just Japanese geostationary weather satellite. So this means that the, the satellite is pointing always to the same uh, location on the Earth, and therefore offers significant improvements in, in, in the frequency uh, of observations. Uh, this satellite provides an image every 10 minutes, and therefore it, it is more useful when it comes to detect the spread of a fire, uh, as you can see in this animation. These are other images uh, offered by satellites, but I'm sure most of you uh, might be familiar with them because uh, they were also uh, in, in the media uh, during this last fire season. And these images uh, here are from high resolution optical data over Bainman's Bay uh, during the 31st of December. And you can clearly uh, see the smoke uh, of the fire front and even the pyrocumulus uh, clouds or, or fire or what we call fire clouds associated uh, with the fire activity. Of course, uh, after the fire season, you can uh, use this information about fire activity or hotspots uh, during a specific period to know how the, the season was. Mm -hmm. And this slide that comes out of a, a report on the state of the environment that we released uh, a few weeks ago, summarized the rank of fire activity by, by a region in Australia. And clearly shows us uh, that while fire activity uh, last year was below or average across most of the inland due to low fuel loads uh, because of the dryness, it was the highest uh, since at least 2000 in Tasmania, the East Coast, and parts of Western Australia. <clears throat> so finally, uh, during the, the finally during, sorry, so finally during the post-fire uh, phase of fire management, the objective here is to um, 
to map a, a defect of the car, basically how much area is being burned uh, in, in which severity, and then also to compute the, the emissions resulting from the fire, and also to look at how the vegetation is uh, recovering after the fire. So in the same way that uh, we can detect changes in fuel moisture content because plants with different water content have different spectral response, here we can detect fire severity because they reflect or burn area because the reflectance, uh, the reflectance spectra for unburned vegetation canopy and fires uh, affecting different vegetation strata are very different. And those difference differences uh, can be used to map uh, total burn extent and fire severity. So this animation show an example of the total burn extent of the fires uh, West Sydney uh, last fire season. Uh, the yellows indeed show the active fires, uh, similarly as I previously showed at the time of the acquisition, and, uh, and the, the black shows the area damage uh, at, at, at its time. So seeing, using that also from the NASA MODI sensor, uh, we recently analyzed in this uh, report I mentioned on the Australian environment in 2009, we estimate uh, uh, the burn area per land cover uh, to clearly show that the bushfires uh, we just had were unprecedented in the forested environments of Australia. And, and this analysis only included the area burned up to 2019. That was the, the period of um, study. But uh, as I mentioned before, fire is not really a binary process. So uh, the analysis of fire impacts uh, require better discrimination of the variation of burn severity and satellite data can also uh, provide this information. For example, uh, this is a map of the severity of the Pirchi fire that happened in Queensland. Uh, so this fire went uh, pyroconvective uh, on the 18th of November and burned right up to two significant dams, uh, which are water resources for, uh, for two areas in Queensland. So we provided these maps because they help the Queensland Fire Emergency Services to talk to the local council about targeting remediation uh, efforts to protect the water supply post, uh, post fire. So basically, it, it tells you where you need to be more quicker uh, making remediation activities because the fire has been affecting this area more severe than others. So one important aspect of any uh, satellite-based uh, maps of any kind of variable is uh, validation. We need to remember that the satellites uh, record some information that net then needs to be converted into, so to collect data that then need to be converted into useful information. And for that, we use algorithms. So once we derive maps of whatever we are uh, targeting, in this case, fire severity, then we need to do field validation. And these are some images, uh, this picture show some of the, um, the observations we took of the severity of the fire, uh, the Oral Valley fire here in the ACT uh, in February. Basically, we flew with an helicopter and we took uh, visual estimates of the fire severity at the same, that, at the same time that we also took uh, photos uh, with a normal camera. And these are some uh, the, the, um, the, the, the tracks uh, we did during one of the days we flew. So this is the, the sample of, of the severity map for the oral ballet uh, that we derived using. In this specific case, we use uh, data from the European Space Agency's uh, Sentinel-2 sensor that provides imagery, imagery every five days at 10 meters spatial resolution on the ground. 
And again, uh, overlapping this map, I, I have uh, those dots that are the observations we took from the helicopter. So again, once we, you do the modeling and you have a map, you always need to do some field validation. And here, for example, this spot that is in the green area, that this area affected with low severity, we have this picture taken from the helicopter that shows that indeed that area was not heavily affected. We only have a few canopies that were scored. This other dot that is in, in the yellow area that are medium severity. Here we see that most of the can well, all the canopies are scored. And if we take a dot in the red area, we see how the vegetation is completely gone. So there's no fuel left there. So the fire was more intense. So I guess just to, to finalize and, and my take home message, I, I guess is that the increasing challenging fire management situation are calling for proactive approaches to reduce the likelihood of catastrophic bushfires. Remote sensing information has already and will be in the, in the future support fire management in Australia through providing additional intelligence to better plan, prepare, and respond to bushfires. But my, my, I guess my key message is that on top of using better information technologies, the governments and individuals also need to take serious act actions to tackle the underlying problem with this uh, climate change. So I think that was everything I wanted to cover tonight. I hope you enjoy uh, my talk. And now I'm ready to take questions. Thank you for listening. All right, so we have a few questions already. So um, the first question is uh, whether in the future, uh, how can we reduce the potential for fires? Well, this is an excellent question, and that really touches in my last point. So with better information, we can be better prepared, and we can better plan and better um, respond, but uh, we will not stop fires to happen in the future. So for that, really, we need to tackle uh, climate change and, and make a serious uh, efforts to reduce the, the <clears throat> The, the, the increase in the temperature in the ocean. So the next question is um, whether uh, there are predictions for the next summer, uh, 2021. Well, I don't think we have predictions yet, but um, it's, it's, it's very difficult to know what is going to happen because in one, as I said at the beginning, Fire risk depends on many factors. So one is the fuel load, the other is uh, the dryness of the fuel. On one hand, there has been so many fires that the fuel has been reduced dramatically. So there is not much fuel to be left uh, to be burned. But on the other hand, uh, the areas that have not been burned uh, may be drier if, if we still have uh, a dry um, spring, dry winter, dry, dry spring and, and dry summer. So it's still a bit early to know what's going to happen. So another question is, if more prescribed burns have been conducted in the areas burned last fire season, would the burn areas be low and not have resulted in fires we had? Well, there's a very hot debate around that and the answer to that is not simple. It's re it really depends on, on, on a specific case. So for the oral ballet specifically, we show that the areas that were recently burned uh, with prescribed burns in, in recent years were uh, affected uh, with, with less severity than areas that were not burned in the recent uh, years. But uh, this has not been uh, observed in all the fires. So it's very hard to, to have a direct uh, relationship between a uh, reduction of fuel and, and the effect on the fire severity and occurrence. 
Will you always need to verify the satellite data or will you eventually be able to rely on satellites alone? Well, that's an excellent question. And I think we always need to verify the satellite data, at least in the research development phase. So once you have validated your algorithm and you know how it works, and how accurate it is, then you can just run it and forget about the validation. But again, that initial evaluation is, is very important to also give an idea of the uncertainty of the algorithm. Let's see. Okay, so it seems that there are no more questions coming. So thank you for your time tonight. And I hand it to Brad now. Yeah, thanks, Marta. Thanks for doing that. That was uh, fantastic. Um, and so, you know, we'll, uh, we'll finish uh, right now with uh, looking a bit backwards and a bit up um, from uh, instead of looking down. Um, and uh, we'll uh, just do a few more objects um, and then uh, we'll call it for the night. Uh, just keeping in mind that the next public night will be in about a month, uh, 26 June. That again will be virtual. Uh, so stay tuned for the speakers and we'll also do some different objects with the, the virtual telescope. Um, and there's a few other events happening in the meantime, so feel free to for, check out the page. Um, now, obviously, one of the big things to see, especially right now, it's very clear above us, um, and that is the Southern Cross. You can see that right in the middle. It's pretty high in the sky. Now, one of the cool things about the Southern Cross is actually what we call the pointers. Uh, so these are two stars that point, as we call that, to the Southern Cross. And the brightest, this bottom one, is what we call Alpha Centauri, uh, or Rigel Centaurus. Uh, now, so some stars are called Alpha or Beta, and you'll hear Omega later. Uh, one of the things that we do in astronomy is the brightest object in the constellation is Alpha, and then the second is Beta, and then Delta, Gamma, so on. Then we get to omega, and then we go A through Z, and then we just start calling them numbers. So Alpha Centauri just simply means the brightest object in the constellation Centaurus, just as that's Alpha Crux, Beta Crux, Delta Crux, Gamma Crux, Epsilon Crux. Um, now Alpha Crux, or Alpha Centauri rather, is a very special object. And the reason it is special, it is the closest star to us besides the sun. So it's the closest thing to our solar system um, and beyond. Now it's 4.2 light years away. So that means if you're staring outside right now and you're looking at Alpha Centauri, the light you're seeing now left 4.2 years ago. It left in 2016. Uh, 2016 seems like a much simpler time, but that's a different story. It left four years ago. It literally takes four years to reach us and then to return. So it's interesting because Let's imagine uh, you're standing on Alpha Centauri. Uh, let's say I transfer you there and you, know, you send a message, pick up a phone and say, hey, hello, I'm here. I won't hear for 4.2 years. And then I have to reply back. It's an eight and a half year conversation, eight and a half years just to say hello. You know, that is really bad internet lag. I know we complain about the internet speeds here in Australia, but that puts it a bit into perspective, in my opinion. Now, Alpha Centauri is also special. It's not only just a, not a single star, there's actually three stars. There's Alpha Centauri A and B, and then there's Proxima Centauri. So Proxima Centauri is a much smaller, what we call M dwarf, a red giant, that orbits around it. Now, the, the two main stars, Alpha Centauri A and B, one of the great things you can see is through a telescope, you can actually start to see that it's not one star, that is two stars. Now this looks weird because it is. It's kind of like if you're imagining you're staring down a road and you see the car headlights and as the car gets closer, you start to see the two lights becoming clearer and clearer. So it starts as one light, starts to be smudged and becoming two. So through the telescope, I just took an image and you start to see here's kind of one circle, and here's another. Instead of just a nice round circle, there are two. Now, in fact, it's actually even more clear with your eye, my uh, phone, uh, my camera rather, I wasn't really able to grasp just a great detail because through the telescope, you can really see 
these two bright dots. And these are, you know, this is the closest solar system to us. And we can see those two objects uh, for our own eyes. Now, there's also something else to look at in the constellation Centaurus, and that is Omega Centauri. So, so the way to find this is we have the Southern Cross, we have the bright pointers, and they point to the Southern Cross. Now, if you kind of follow up from Beta Centauri or Hadar, and you follow a straight line, we get to another bright star. Then we get to, it will look like a star to your own eyes but it's actually kind of a fuzzy blob. And that fuzzy blob is what we call Omega Centauri. And Omega Centauri is not a star at all. It's a globular cluster. So this is another image from Dave Weldrake he took um, with our telescope uh, recently. And you know, so it's what you're seeing here is what it looks like through the telescope. It's amazing. This globular cluster has 10 million stars in this little ball, 10 million solar systems, 10 million suns, not quite the same size of our sun, but it's a range, 10 million objects in this little ball. And yet, even though it appears as a bright dot on the sky, it is this beautiful globular cluster. Now, Omega Centauri is quite interesting. Um, Omega Centauri is it's a, very con it's a very dense, it's a very big globular cluster, and it's also different than the other globular clusters. And one of the things that has been studied at Mount Shromlo um, for the better part of 70 years is this, con this globular cluster. And what people think is that, in fact, it actually used to be the center of an entire other galaxy, a dwarf galaxy. And as that galaxy came into our Milky Way, the Milky Way started to pull it apart and swallowed it and the rest of the, the outside kind of got destroyed, and what's left is just this little core, the little inside ball of the remaining stars. So we think that Omega Centauri may have been, is the remnant of a galaxy that's been destroyed by our own Milky Way. And when you look at also this photo, you see a couple things. You notice um, immediately there's different colors here, and these colors are real. Now, when you go into the sky, whether it's looking at Betelgeuse uh, and Orion or you know, anywhere else in the nighttime sky, stars' color relate to their temperature. So imagine flame. So imagine a flame. As uh, the hotter the flame gets, it gets from red to yellow to orangey to that bluey white flame where that white blue flame is, is really the hottest. So hot things burn bluer cooler things burn redder. So when you see these blue stars, they're actually burning hotter. The red stars are burning, burning cooler. So we can actually measure and see their temperatures differences with our own eyes. And there's another thing we can relate to this. Hotter things also are younger things. So the younger stars burn more hotter, bluer. The older stars are a bit cooler, redder. So immediately, just by seeing the range, we can see where the hot young stars are and the older, cooler stars are. And so someone just asked, why are there so many suns in the area? And that's again, so we think because this was a, a condensed galaxy, that as the dwarf galaxy came into our Milky Way, the rest of, you know, the outside started to get ripped apart. And what's left is just a very bound through gravity, a very contained um, area in there. Uh, and someone actually asked a very good question. How can we tell there are 10 million stars? Now, we don't know the exact number. Uh, you know, we don't sit there counting them. Um, you know, here, here's a great example. You know, we estimate there's 300 billion stars in our Milky Way. And if you can count a star, so imagine this. So imagine you count five stars per second. So you go one, two, three, four, five, and that's a second, and then six, seven, eight, nine, ten, and so on. And imagine you just did that your entire life. And, and, and that's all you did. It would take thousands of years to count the stars in our Milky Way. So the way we can estimate it is through two things. We can measure its mass, we can feel how heavy it is, and get an estimate of that. And we know it weighs about four to four and a half million times the mass of our sun. So we can kind of weigh it. And we weigh it based on measuring how fast it's spinning and moving, uh, and a few other ways. And we, we can also then measure, we can take chunks, we can take density chunks, we can take a very small portion 
and a couple small po portions, see actually how many stars are in that small portion, and then figure out and estimate overall. So that's a really good question. We, we think there's about 10 million stars, um, you know, give or take. And both of that estimate is arrived by a couple of different ways. But Omega Centauri is a really great thing to see in the nighttime sky. Uh, and in a very dark sky like tonight, uh, it was really great and easy to see this. And again, you can even through a pair of binoculars, if you start to focus in on it, you see it's not a dot, you see it's fuzzy. It looks weird compared to the other stars. And that's the great thing about it is, if you take a pair of binoculars and you look at Alpha Centauri or Alpha Crux, it looks like a star. And then you start to look at Omega Centauri and you're like, hmm, that's kind of fuzzy. Why does it look that way? So um, someone just asked, what are the hottest stars called and what are the coolest stars called? So we classify stars in a category, we go from O, B, A, G, K, M. Now the reason we do that um, used to be, it's an old archaic system where if someone thought they ordered it in A to B or A through O, we realize it's not the case. So the hotter stars, the youngest stars are O and B type stars. And then you get to the more middle stars like G. So our sun is in the middle of its life. It's a, a yellow dwarf giant or yellow dwarf star. Um, uh, so it's a, a G type, a G3 type star. The cooler ones become M dwarfs, um, or we also call them red supergiants. So some of the big blue stars will be blue supergiants. Some of the, the big red stars will be red supergiants. So great question. Now, in about 10 minutes, if you look towards the east, you'll start to see two bright things pop up in the nighttime sky, and that's Jupiter and Saturn. So I actually, what you'll see of Saturn is I took it last night. So I did have to cheat and take this last night because we couldn't stay up that late. But if you'll stay out and if you go outside in a few minutes, especially in about an hour from now, you'll see two bright objects in the eastern horizon, and that will be Jupiter and Saturn. Now, firstly, one of the cool things is how do you just see or tell if a planet is a planet in the nighttime sky? Planets don't twinkle. So if you look in the sky right now, you'll see some stars are twinkling, especially as you go towards the horizon where there's more turbulence. So turbulence, the same reason your airplane shake is the same reason a star twinkles. And as you get more towards the horizon, there's more turbulence and you see those stars twinkling, you know, the color slightly flicking and changing. Planets don't twinkle. Why don't they twinkle? Well, the cool thing is, it actually really isn't to do with our atmosphere or astronomy. It's actually our eyes. So these stars that we see, pretty much just single points of light come through um, the, uh, the atmosphere. And that atmosphere is twinkling around, so we see it moving. Now, Jupiter and Saturn are a bit closer. Now, because they're a bit closer, they actually have more points of light coming into our atmosphere. Now our eye is not sensitive enough to see that. So our eye just kind of blends it together and we see it as a bright point. And if you remember when we looked at back at the moon a little bit later, there were actually parts where the moon appeared to wobble and you can actually kind of see a bit of the turbulence in the moon itself. Now, if you go out tonight and, or any night and you stare at the moon, you don't see the moon twinkling, but we can actually see a bit of the effects of the atmosphere looking to the moon through a telescope. Um, so Jupiter and Saturn, you can pinpoint it as those bright dots. Now the other thing with uh, planets is they form what's called a line across the sky we call the ecliptic. So if you know kind of roughly where the sun rises and sets, our solar system is a big disk or a, a plate. And the planets form and travel along the same line. They go across an arc across the sky. So if you can make an imaginary line connecting the movement of the sun from the rising in the east, going all the way across, setting in the west, what you'll see is any bright dot that's not twinkling and along that line roughly will be a planet. So you can actually, I'll actually predict, so it, the sun will set right there or the sun will rise right there tomorrow. That's where the sun will rise. So it's a really cool way of figuring out planets with your own eyes. It's just by seeing them. Um, now, Saturn. So 
you can actually already see here, here's a bit of the rings of Saturn and the gap. Now I'm gonna zoom in on the second. We don't see the color as well, um, unfortunately, or I, my eye picked it up really well, but the quick picture I took in it. But you can already see the gaps here. Now the great thing about Saturn is it does tilt. So sometimes we see Saturn beautifully where we can clearly make out the main bit of the planet and the rings, but sometimes it's almost face on that it looks like a straight line. And someone just asked, how good does your telescope need to be to be able to see uh, Saturn or Jupiter? Um, now, I'll just put that in a scale. Uh, the telescope that Galileo used to see the four moons of Jupiter was four centimeters. It doesn't actually have to be that big to start resolving Jupiter and Saturn. Even with a good pair of binoculars, you can start to see the moons of Jupiter. You'll see the bright circle of Jupiter and four bright dots around it. And next month, we're gonna take a very cool look at Jupiter. Um, and we should be able to see some of the gas bands uh, and we can see some of the moons. And hopefully if we could take a few time lapses of it, we can actually see the moons moving around Jupiter. So they actually do move around Jupiter, it's really cool. Now, uh, so when you look at Saturn, I really love Saturn because it's exactly what it looks like. It's not, this isn't fake, you know, this is exactly what it looks like, you know, and we zoom in, uh, we can really start to see, here is the gap of Saturn. You can even see the main ball here, uh, the main part of the planet, and clearly the rings around it. Saturn looks exactly as described. Now, one of the great things about rings of Saturn is, Saturn is not the only planet with rings. In fact, all four gas giants, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune, all have ring system. Uh, Saturn just has the biggest rings, and so obviously we see it the best. But the others um, have uh, just as many rings. Now, um, one of the other things that I think is really cool with Saturn, and next month we'll try and take a closer look at to make out, is it has a very big moon called Titan. And Titan's a very interesting place where we think has water and ice, uh, and it could host life. Now, Saturn actually has the most moons in our solar system. Saturn has 82 moons. Uh, Jupiter only has 79. So Saturn took back the title of most moons in the solar system uh, about 18 months ago. Um, and as I said, next month, we'll take a look at Jupiter and we'll take a little bit closer look at some of its moons, something that uh, Ryan talked about a little bit earlier. Um, now, uh, we have time just for a few minute questions. And, and I look, I, I, I hope we've all enjoyed our virtual thing. And I can't, I look forward to the day when we're all back at Stromlo and we can look at the telescope because I still get excited seeing Saturn and being like, yes, that's exactly how it looks like. Um, just as described. That's what we like in astronomy, just as described. Um, so someone just asked, do we know how far away the closest black hole to Earth is? Yes, uh, we do know the answer to this. And this was a recent discovery a couple weeks ago. A black hole a thousand light years away was recently discovered. So that to date uh, is the closest black hole um, that we can get. And now a thousand light years is still pretty far away. The Milky Way is a hundred thousand light years across. So if you stood on one side, turn on a torch, it would take a hundred thousand years to get to the other side. In this case, it's only a thousand years, but the star system, uh, can actually be resolved with the eyes. And in fact, what we'll do is next, next month, we'll take a look and actually try and see the exact spot where the closest black hole is to the Earth. And I'll show you how to find it. So it's a really cool thing we can now do. Now it is far away. So how long to take to drive? Well, a thousand light years. Um, so let's put this in a scale. I won't drive there. We'll send Voyager. Now Voyager will take about, so Voyager just to get to Alpha Centauri, so Voyager is the furthest probe we sent, to get to Alpha Centauri, which is four light years away, would take 75,000 years. So to get to a thousand light years, you're talking about a very, very, very long time. Talking about over a million years to get to the nearest black hole. Now, we do think there's a lot of black holes in the, Sol in the Milky Way, anywhere between tens of millions upwards to 100 million. And we do have the supermassive black hole, but most of the black holes are quite small because this black hole 
that's near to us, this thousand light year distance black hole is only four times the mass of our sun. So it's actually quite small. Um, and, and I'll end on this question because I think it's always a nice one. What got me interested in astronomy? Uh, I wasn't someone who looked at the telescope when I was a kid. I, um, I, I wasn't really interested in astronomy when I was younger. It was when I went to university and I didn't really know what I wanted to do. I did some physics, I did philosophy, I did theology, and I, did, I tried different areas of physics. And then I said, hey, astro astrophysics, yeah, that sounds fun. I emailed a few professors in the department. One replied, and, and that was pretty much it. And so I, it's, some people know and feel they're destined to be an astronomer, and they're amazing people. And there's a lot of people who work, we work with. I wasn't one, and I think that's kind of important to hear because sometimes, especially kids, if you're listening, you know, you think that you have to know what you're going to be in the future. You don't. It's okay. It's okay to change your mind. Uh, just do something that's fun because if you're doing something that's fun, you'll enjoy it and then you'll succeed at it. I think that's the coolest thing that you can have. So we're going to end it there. Um, I think, you know, thank you everyone for tuning in. Thanks to our amazing speakers, Ryan and Marta. And again, next month on the 26th of June, we'll have another virtual public night. We'll have a few different talks. We'll look at a few different things. Um, and uh, I hope everyone has a rest of the great weekend. Um, and be safe and be well. Take care.